I know it's painful for those who have been partners of Candida uh, as we sunset. My goal in my last year at Candida, and I've been there a little over five years now, um, is to try and help our grantees position themselves for success after we sunset. So if you got any ideas, um, but there's no more money. <laughs> so, but there are other things that we can do. I'll give you one example. One of the things that we were doing um, up, up in Asheville was uh, talking about um, how seven of our core grantees might collaborate um, in working on issues in the South. Well, a lot of other foundations don't know who y'all are. And they certainly don't know the smaller of the groups. And they don't know that you are looking at, at possible collaboration. And, um, and so all of you are kind of on the small end of the nonprofit scale. And so foundations tend to like to support larger you know, uh, initiatives. And so having a collaborative effort like that can Candida can help position y'all for success with a collaborative effort after we are gone. So that's kind of what I'm up to now. Um, so, uh, and by the way, I'm going to go through some ideas here, but please ask questions, you know. Um, I learned so many acronyms, I forget your name, from you in like a 30-second introduction. So if I use a term you don't know or you, you want to go in more depth, you know, uh, just, just let me know there. So, so I was executive director um, at South Face for almost 40 years, you know. Um, how does anyone stay in the same job for 40 years. <laughs> you know, I didn't. Um, and it's because South Face is an entrepreneurial nonprofit. And the job changed many times over that 40 year period. And so my, even though my title might have not changed, my role, what I was doing, what got me passionate about the work here changed dramatically, actually, over that period. And some of the, the, the veterans here will know, you know, I was fond of saying, you know, change is constant. And, and if you're an entrepreneurial nonprofit, that's a good thing, you know. Um, and so um, sometimes people get a little um, nervous about change, and, it's, and, and you need to embrace it. Um, and so, because that's important. So, um, so as I was um, mulling over my thoughts, I thought, well, I, I want to go deeper into this, this idea of change. In my mind, there was sort of two types of change here at, at, at South Face. Um, one was what you often expect. It was this incremental change. It was patient, um, very effective, and I would argue incredibly important. Um, because really that kind of incremental change is about movement building. And if there's anything South Face can be proud of is this organization has helped build the sustainability movement, not just in the South, but in this country, and occasionally sometimes outside this country. And so it, it is a movement. And you should feel, well, I don't want to tell you what you should, I felt incredibly proud to be part of building a movement. Um, and so, and that's, that's critical work that, that South Face does. Um, so let me, let me give you an example of this movement. This true example just happened about a month ago. How many of you were at the um, Georgia Climate Conference over in Athens? Yeah. Um, so, so I was there networking. Laura, you were there probably networking. You know, um, you know that's part of building the movement. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, at Mike, but it's true for so many of you. know, Mike, you've done how many workshops in your life? Seven. <laughs> seven, yes. <Yeah, seven. laughs> I would have given you eight or nine. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know that South Face ever tallied it up. I mean, years ago, we, we figured out we had trained over 10,000 people. That's not training, that's building a movement. And so the specific example I want to give you is the new 
vice president for, sustainab for infrastructure and sustainability was a speaker at the climate conference in Athens a, a month ago. And I wanted to get to know her. I didn't know her. She'd come from the University of Hawaii. Um, she had gotten her PhD at Georgia Tech, but then, had, or she came from Northwest. And she'd been at several universities and, and had a, you know, a stellar career. And I, you know, I wait my turn as everyone's up there trying to talk to her afterwards. And I go up and, and she goes, how you doing, Dennis? <laughs> I've, I've never seen this person in my life, never met her. When she was a graduate student at Georgia Tech, she used to go to the Sustainable Atlanta roundtables. And, she, and the truth, she said, that inspired me to really double down on a career in sustainability. That's building a movement. And South Face should be proud of that. And in my five years at Candida, I cannot tell you how many times people have come up to me that I did not know and, and would say, oh, you used to be at South Face. Here's what South Face did for me. Answer the phone, reply to a text, help me through a training program, you know, just any, any number of ways. And so that kind of change, I think we, we ignore sometimes, and it's really critical because that's how you build movements, and we are not gonna be successful without building a movement around sustainability or whatever we, we wanna call it. By the way, there'll be 10 new buzzwords you know, within the next year or two on what we're trying to call what we're doing. And that's good. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that slow incremental change. Um, any of you been to the Grand Canyon? You know, the Colorado River is, you know, it's, it's a big stream. It, you know, it's not, before it was dammed, it, you know, it was even smaller, but, but, um, but yet, you know, that's where the Grand Canyon came from. It's, you know, it's that persistent, small flow of water and not giving up. And so that's what it takes to build a movement. So um, I should talk more about movement building, but I'm not, and about incremental change. Um, uh, well, I guess, I guess I got one other um, example here. Um, who knows ResNet? I got you on an acronym. <laughs> Residential S Energy. Services Network. Are they still around? Yeah. Sort of. Well, Michael, Michael confirmed that, or, or truth, or fact checked me. Yeah. So years ago, the head of ResNet was a guy named Steve Baden, and he said to me, South Face has got all these sleeper cells all over the, the country. And I was like, Steve, that's a bad analogy, really, you know? <laughs> but what he was saying was there were so many folks in the industry in the sustainability industry, if we just call it that, who had come through South Face as an intern or a staff, board member or whatever, who were out there doing very important work. And you know, for the longest time, I used to think, oh gosh, you know, so-and-so's leaving us, you know, how are we ever gonna replace them? And we would. And then that so-and-so would go start a business. <laughs> doing energy service work, or they, you know, my gosh, we had half a dozen, if not more people that worked for the U.S. Green Building Council and helped shape many things there. Or um, at the, the meeting we had in Asheville last week, um, Green Spaces, the um, Green Built Alliance, um, all had, had South Face alum um, on their staff in leadership roles there. And so, so um, you know, um, New Buildings Institute, uh, ILFI, Ver uh, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, Elevate Energy, I mean, that was just the few that I could think of off the top of my head, have South Face alum that are helping build this movement. And I think that's a really important part of this organization. And, and so I just wanted to, to raise that up. So the main thing I wanted to talk about was um, another type of change that I think is also critical for South Face, and South Face is positioned for this type of change better than many because of your, the entrepreneurial spirit here. And I didn't know what to call it. I, I just, inflection. You know, it's the opposite of that incremental. You know, it's, it's more noticeable. 
It's often at greater scale. It um, comes usually quicker, um, always with late nights. Um, and so, so what was the first point of inflection for South Face? And I, I think this gets at the DNA. I don't think anyone would come up with this one. <laughs> Mike, I know you were over there. Uh, Mike always wants to get the right answer. Uh, <laughs> So we started as an all-volunteer organization around an event called Sunday. Raise your hand if you'd heard of Sunday before you came here. Yeah, you're lying if you did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. everybody thought it was you know, a Sunday or the, the day of, of worship or whatever. It was Wednesday, May 3rd, 1979. It was like Earth Day. So back in the 70s when Earth Day was launched, that brought the spotlight on the environmental challenges we were facing. Energy was not considered an environmental challenge when Earth Day was launched. And so the same people who brought you Earth Day a few years later said, hey, we got to start dealing with energy as an environmental issue. Or we're going to fry the planet and do other things, you know, um, smog, you know, ozone, you know, every, nuclear waste, everything you can imagine was linked to, to energy. So there were 50 Sunday organizing committees in the United States, one for each state. How many are left today? And, and who is it? South Face. Thank God we changed the name. <laughs> We're no longer the Georgia Sunday Committee. <laughs> but, um, and so why is it that one out of 50 survived? A lot of reasons, probably. One of the most important reasons is that it, right at the beginning, the folks who, who had the vision for South Face, they knew that you, had, you couldn't tell someone what to do without, in the next breath, being able to tell them, and here's how you can do it. Here's how I can help you. And being science-based, being accurate, being trustworthy in that advice you gave. And that really was, the, I think, the secret sauce, the inflection point for South Face, where I, it, it ceased being one of great groups of you know, all volunteers, very passionate about the environment, but becoming a trusted resource for the, the work that y'all do. So early inflection points. You know, and it's funny, when I was putting these comments together, I enjoyed it because I was thinking, well, what were the inflection points? Because you, sometimes you don't notice them, but coming back. Um, how many energy code workshops has South Face done? Seven. 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 <laughs> seven. So, yeah. so, and this gets back to where kind of incremental change and, and um, inflection are intertwined. So we were doing a, a, at a conference networking, and there was a mid-level manager there from the Tennessee Valley Authority. And there was this new idea coming out about, well, we need a model energy code for this country. There were no energy codes back in the late 70s, early 80s. And so we met this guy at this conference, and a little bit later, got a call from TVA that said, you know, we're we're interested in this, idea, this novel idea about energy codes. Um, we'd like for y'all to do an energy code training for us. Um, you know, TVA is a utility that covers seven states in the South. And so it's like, can you do that? Oh, you bet. No problem. We can do that. So Jeff Tiller, who, if you haven't heard his name, Jeff and I were basically the co-directors of that all-volunteer effort, and then Jeff stayed at South Face for another 10 years, and then um, went on to Appalachian State. But so, um, so Jeff developed the first curriculum on teaching the energy code. Um, and Jeff and I taught the first energy code workshop in the South. By the way, it was the first energy code workshop that either Jeff or I ever attended as well. <laughs> And so I bring this up because it was an inflection point. Prior to that, we had sort of been, we were, you know the term barn raising? Yeah. We were doing hands-on workshops, which was great work in communities, you know, weatherizing uh, low-income folks' houses or building, 
you know, this was the age of passive solar design, building a solar greenhouse or a solar water heater. Good work. I, I don't want to speak against that work. But it, you know, it, it was very small. And so by doing this workshop for TVA, that was nice. You know, we got, got to do half a dozen workshops around the region. But what it really did was it helped us look not to just doing sort of community-based program, which is important, but it was the first time we started working with design and construction professionals. And that was huge. Um, you know, there's a, I, I'm going to date myself, you probably have never heard of this gangster called Willie Sutton. Everybody knows of Al Capone and all that. Well, Willie Sutton was, a, was really a, the, the professional bank robber. I mean, he wrote, robbed more banks, and you know, when, once he was interviewed by the media, and they said, well, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. <laughs> so why do, you, why do you make an inflection to go and work teaching design and construction professionals around about the energy code? That's who designs and builds buildings, and that's where the energy is used. And so... Well, I thought you were going to say that's where the money was. <laughs> well, no, it's not, no, no. And, and so, you know, so Jeff was really critical in that inflection point. Mike, um, just to give you a shout out, you know, South Face has been known for, you know, um, its energy code work. Um, and so, and it's because of Mike and others um, that have really um, recognized the importance of that and helped build the movement um, as a result of that. Um, so, you, by the way, you, you, just, you just don't even realize the whole idea of an energy code in the South, I mean, you literally had people saying, well, that's communistic. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that joke just, yeah, right. but it was true. It was, it was communism, yeah. you know, telling us how we should, should build our buildings. And so, um, so that was uh, transformational. Um, Mike, I'm going to give you an, another um, shout out um, because we did a lot of training workshops and that was very important um, for building the movement. But there was an inflection point around those workshops that we were doing and that's when we really started to recognize the value of certification-based training. It took more training to cut hair in every southern state in the 80s than it took to be called an energy professional. You had, there was no training requirements at all. But you couldn't cut hair unless you had a certificate that you had gone through some training. And so that's changed now. I know the change is not over. But South Face was a big part of that change, especially here in the South. Um, and I know others in this room deserve a shout out for doing that as well. But um, so another transformational uh, change there. Uh, and, and I got to talk about, uh, well, the campus, but I'm going to start with the building next door. So um, the South, we still call it the South Face Resource Center or it's probably, yeah. yeah, okay, South Face Resource Center. Everybody know the history of that? The Summer Olympics came to Atlanta in 1996. We had no land and no money, but we wanted to build a demonstration center to take advantage of the Olympics. And so, oh, sh sure, <laughs> why not? Um, but we were successful um, in, in doing that. And it gave us a nice office, and, and that's good. But really what it did was it created a couple of inflection points. And so this was when you said green building, builders thought you were talking about the color of the house. I'm not making this up. It's true. Um, or even worse, I don't know if you've ever heard the term when someone's green behind the ears, meaning they don't know what they're doing. Builders thought green meant, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not going to do that, you know. And so, um, so the Resource Center really was one of the first um, levers to pull to start changing the, the um, perception of green building, certainly in the South, and I would argue um, beyond the South. 
first Energy Star building in the South. Um, true story, uh, Home Builders Association in Columbia rented a bus. About 50 of them came over here for a tour of the, of the resource center. And, um, you know, and, and the building, it wasn't bad. I mean, for its time, it was one of the most advanced buildings around. But this one builder was so disappointed, you could just tell. And I, I said, you know, well, what do you think? And he goes, it looks just like every other house. <laughs> and I went, yes. <laughs> so, um, so it, I mean, that was really transformational um, for, uh, for many reasons. One is we wouldn't have an Earthcraft house program today if it hadn't have been for that house, that, that resource center. Um, I mean, it was so novel, it, it got so much attention, it brought the home builders to South Face. We had tried, we'd done a couple of workshops here and there, but they really, they really saw this as something they needed to be engaged with. And go back to Willie Sutton, why do you want to work with the Home Builders Association, which my Sierra Club friends, and I didn't disagree with them, the Home Builders Association was just sort of to the right of Attila the Hun when it came to environmental sensitivity. And so why would you want to partner with them on a green building program? It's because who's building the houses? How many Earthcraft homes, Amelia? Over 50,000. So that's a pretty dang fine inflection point, isn't it? It wouldn't have happened without the resource center. And then the vision to see um, how to turn that into a program. And there are a lot of people who are behind that vision and that inflection point. Laura Capps comes to mind, but, but, but others. I know, Amelia, I think you're leading the, the charge on that now. And so it's sort of moved from an inflection point to now movement building for sure. Um, Robert, I'm sitting right next to you. What other green building program um, at that stage in the development of the industry had a communities program? None. In the South? Absolutely none. Um, maybe in Portland. <laughs> Yeah, that's called um, case study. Case study. <laughs> you all know case, case is an acronym for copy and steal everything. <laughs> Which, by the way, I did not come up with that, so I, <laughs> but I practice it. So Robert Walter Brown, another South Face person who went on to work for Jamestown and was very instrumental in uh, Pond City Market development and, and other projects. And all. I'm sorry, what? Glenwood Park. Glenwood Park. Serenby. You know, all these. So big inflection point for the Earthcraft program there. Um, another one that I'm uh, proud, you're proud of all your children, of course. <laughs> but another inflection point that I'm particularly proud of, um, almost every green building program um, started off with working with single family high-end homes. Earthcraft is no exception. A lot of green building programs that's where they, they, they started and they still are. But Earthcraft was one of the few, or one of the first, I guess. I, I can't say with certainty it was the first, but it was certainly one of the first that said, you know, we always talk about sustainability as being this three-legged stool. You know, there's the environment and there's economy and the third leg of the stool is equity. But we're just going to talk about, you know, environment and economy today. We'll get to equity another day. And for years, no one ever got to equity. And so Earthcraft Multifamily was really one of the first times a green building program seriously addressed equity. Um, and so what a great inflection point um, that was. How many affordable housing? I'm sorry, what? Huh? A lot? So, yeah, seven. <laughs> seven factorial, so something else. So, um, and, and, and James mentioned this, you know, um, the resource center and the work that South Face did on early work on green building really helped shape the, the U.S. Green Building Council. And I know we've always had this. What's the word for competition and cooperation? Frenemy. Frenemy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's mostly been friend. Um, and so... Um, 
it, and I help it shape that. And I'm, I'm, you know, Atlanta is a leader in the Southeast for LEED certified buildings. I think it's still the number one city in the South. It's in the top five in the U.S. Top five in the U.S. I would argue, without this campus, if you will, uh, and now I'm looking at Laura, <laughs> because it was a training element. But you know, early on, South Face was providing technical assistance on almost every LEED building with the exception of the ones at Emory, because <laughs> they had Laura. <laughs> but then Laura came over here, and so there's just a lot of lead buildings out there that are better because of the work of, of, of folks here um, on doing that. And so that, again, is, is a movement building. And think about this building. And, um, and you know, and I, you know, one of my jobs at Candida was to be the liaison on the Candida building, you know, living building over at Georgia Tech, a really terrific building. There's never been a perfect building, but it is really a really good building. Think of what's unique about the Candida building. Help me out here. Who's been over to the building? Well, just name two or three things that are unique about the Candida building. It, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking more from, let's, let's, let's nerd out here. From, wood frame. Yeah, wood yeah, frame, yeah, okay. Price per square foot. Price per square foot, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Reclaimed wood from Texas. Yeah. Composting toilets, the legal system, rainwater, harvest. Yeah. The bees So, if you think about it, a lot of those things y'all mentioned are here. And so, you know, this building is, is in, uh, this campus is inspired um, uh, for a long time. And I, I was talking about LEED, but not just with LEED. Um, and so, and so we think of these inflection points as being programmatic, and all the ones I've talked about have been programmatic. But there are other ways to make a big impact um, at South Face. And I'm looking through Robert to Marcy Reed. <laughs> I don't know if y'all know Marcy's name or not. It happens to be Robert's um, wife. Marcy was the first member of that family to be employed full time at South Face as our development director. And so we had just a, you know, um, not a very strong development program. And, you know, and Marcy came, and it was a huge inflection point for us. And I know Stephanie is, is doing great work and, um, and will continue on, on that. But, so we opened this building, the eco office, um, with not just zero debt, but we had an endowment fund to make improvements on the building. We had never done a capital campaign of that scope before. We hired a consultant, and they, they, I, I forget the numbers, I'll, you know, I'll just give you, a, a good consultant, they knew what they were talking about because uh, they were right in telling us what they told us that we couldn't do it. We wouldn't be able to be successful just raising, raising that much money. And, um, but they didn't understand us. If we'd been a typical nonprofit, they were right. We had no history of raising that kind of money. But because of all the movement building that we had done, we got over a million dollars worth of stuff donated for this building. Um, because of all the movement building that, that we were, had done, people knew who we were. Foundations knew us. And we had foundations that contributed, that had never contributed before. And I'm going to give you one example of a, a part of the movement building that was hugely successful for us. I did a talk three, five years before we built the eco office for the Buckhead Better Buildings Association, uh, Buckhead Better Business Association. Why would I go talk to them? They have the money. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I mean, they're influential people, and you know, you need to. to to bring them along. And that resulted in someone that I didn't even meet at the meeting but contacted me later, um, a guy named Jeff George, was um, a senior person at Hardin Construction. And so the way, one of the ways we were able to build this building is we got five commercial contractors 
to agree to each take a bite of the building and build it at cost, and it wouldn't be too big of a bite for any one of them to do. And so that relationship with Jeff and Harden and other commercial contractors was really an important reason for this building getting built. And I would say, you know, that's about movement building. And then this building became a big inflection point for South Face. Um, so who won, the, Atlanta, who won the, the uh, Department of Energy Better Buildings Challenge 10 years ago? Y'all know the answer. Give that book to people. <laughs> so DOE had a national competition for cities and said, we aren't going to give you any money, but we're just challenging you to reduce energy um, usage in commercial buildings in your city 20% by the year 2020. And it was, a, I think, a three-year. Energy and water? No, you're getting ahead of yourself. It was 20% with a three-year ramp. So who would you put your money on? Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Boston, New York? That's where everybody else is putting their money. So Atlanta won the competition, got the 20% goal ahead of time. Oh, and oh, by the way, we decided energy's not enough. You can't, because of the energy water nexus, you got to add water to it. And the Department of Energy goes, oh, damn. <laughs> and they added water to the challenge. And so, um, and without this building and this inflection point, we would not have built the trust with the commercial real estate industry here in Atlanta. And this is very important for movement building and change in general. Change, and Nathaniel Smith always says this, and I don't know if he originated it or not, but I, you know, I, I'm using a case study on him. Um, change moves at the speed of trust. And so it's, it's so important. And so we had we'd done the groundwork so that we had the trust and we were able to then um, do, anybody remember how many square feet of commercial buildings? participated in the Better Building Challenge? Didn't we like just blow it out of the water? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was it was, I think it was over 100 million yeah. square feet. You know, everybody else was like at 10, 20 million, you know, so. Um, people always thought we cheated. <laughs> we didn't. So, um, so um, my, 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 Final inflection point I want to use is good use. Um, and so uh, when, we, when we launched good use, it was called Grants to Green, um, partnership between the Candida Fund and the Community Foundation of Atlanta. And we did, I don't know if anyone here can correct me on the numbers, so I'll just make them up. You know, for the first couple of years, we did half a dozen or so buildings um, a year. And it was good. I mean, it, you know, the whole, the whole premise is, is incredibly simple and incredibly sound. You know, nonprofits often have crummy buildings with, or older, inefficient buildings, sorry. Um, and oftentimes, the leadership of a nonprofit is someone who's mission-driven to be at that nonprofit. So they're at a daycare center, running a daycare center, and they've got a degree in ch early childhood development. The last thing in the world they want to think about is what kind of heating and cooling or lighting systems they have. And, and they've all had horrible experiences renovating their own houses, and so they aren't going to just pick up the phone and call someone to come in and do, oh, let's do some, some renovations, some upgrades here. And they got no money to do it. And if they got any money, they're going to put it into their programming. And so easy sell. So um, how is it that good use has now done 500 plus nonprofits, 20 plus, 29. Plus 29. Thank you. How much money is it saved? Oh. Millions. Millions. Yeah, I mean, I think 25 million. 25 million plus or minus? 3.5 million annually. 3.5. And so, my God, what an inflection point um, for this organization. And so, um, and I can't even tell you who came up with the idea for it. 
It wasn't me, by the way. And so um, what a great um, program. It's now served as a model for the Department of Energy, and hopefully there's another inflection point coming <laughs> for there. So what are the common threads of these inflection points? Thank you for paying attention. <laughs> Who else? Any? Somebody, somebody mentioned like they thought we were cheating. Somebody in the back said, "Well, we just needed to save so much energy. Our, our buildings were so bad in the first place. Like, there's, a, there's some like there's some energy need, right? There's room for improvement." Mm -hmm. There was definitely a need. So recognizing a need, uh, not just doing high end homes or something like that. Um, so what else? There's no right answer. What, what's what's Servant on Servant leadership approach. Servant leadership. Expound on that, Robert. It's the idea that instead of yelling at someone, sort of showing them and, uh, and sort of bringing them along and, and meeting them where they are. And, yeah. And not necessarily leading a, a particular charge or making anyone bad about it, but sort of bringing them along. And not being a, a know-it-all. You know, I know more than you. You're, you're dumb because you're just that childhood education professional that doesn't know anything. So, yeah. Um, I think that's a good one, Robert. I didn't have that one on my list. Um, I, <laughs> so, any other, other thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would say I'd put a, the star by that one. Um, none of these inflection points come from the top. To be honest, when I was there, James, it maybe it's different now. <laughs> but um, you, you know, you you get ideas, and a lot of times you don't even recognize where the germ of the idea came from. And so, but it's coming from y'all, and you, the predecessors, the other people who used to sit in these seats. I mean, those were the transformational ideas that South Face had the entrepreneurial spirit and leadership that I, I think servant leadership captures it. Um, and by the way, that's just not the, the you know, the, the person at the top of the pyramid. You know, it's, it's the folks who are running a team being servant leaders as much as, as you know, someone that reports to the board of directors. So um, there, it, it's, none of these inflection points have ever been solo acts. They've always been, been teams. And getting buy-in, and that's really the challenge, is if y'all don't buy into something, it, it's going to fail. I can flat it, guarantee you that. And I didn't put those on the card to talk about the failures, because they have been some. But, um, but it, it's, a, it's about buying in. So um, one of the proudest days of my life, professionally, was I was invited to, um, to speak to the uh, Shambly Middle School um, fifth grade class. <laughs> My daughter was in that class. And uh, I always I choke up when I tell this story. I've told it a bunch of times. So Tess was, what, 11? So she meets me at the school, as she's been instructed to do, <laughs> and escorts me to the, the, the classroom and like, you know, demanded that we maintain five feet of clearance between <laughs> us. <laughs> I'm not making this up. I really am not. You know, I'm not an idiot. So, you know, if you're speaking to a bunch of, you know, fifth graders, you know, about what you do and all, you, you kind of, you want to find the hook. So I took a pizza box oven. I, I, you can make a little simple oven out of a cardboard box with saran wrap over the top and generate enough, with a reflective cover and generate enough heat. Not to make pizza, but you can make nacho pizzas. So, you know, you got nachos in there and a very meltable cheese. That's important at room temperature. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about solar energy and doing the nachos, and, you know, it, it went well. And so, so I'm walking back, and my escort is holding my hand as I'm leaving the building. And so because of the work I do, and so, um, and I suspect you all feel the same way. You, why would you be here if you don't feel that you want your life to have purpose, if you don't want your life to, 
to, to make a mark with what you're doing. And so, and I would argue the mark, whether Stephen's not here, but you know, the first impression you make of South Face when you drive up in front of the building can lead to a transformational um, you know, opportunity. And so it's, you know, everyone here has a chance to make, make a mark. So I've, I've, I missed the 20 minute warning, I'm so sorry. I missed the 20 minute warning. Oh. <laughs> so um, anything that y'all wanna talk about? We've got about 10 minutes. Yeah. in some similar sort of movement. What do you see as sort of similar then to say now with the IRA funding and other sort of things? Anything like that that you see that you think is, is particularly sort of helpful? Well, um, I, I think if I use this inflection point, I think South Face is, is um, on the horizon of the largest potential inflection point the organization has ever seen. Um, with all the funding that's coming from the federal government to support climate. I mean, it's huge. And it, 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 by the way, it's not just in the um, Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, it's scattered throughout. I mean, this is, this is I think, an opportunity that if our, if our country fails in doing meaningful work with these resources, um, you know, I, I don't see us ha having another chance anytime soon. And so, so I don't know if that's what you're getting at there. I mean, uh, and it's, it's onerous, it's bureaucratic, it's never designed, you know, um, to, to maximize the opportunity. All those things are true. But nonetheless, it is uh, um, such a, an inflection point that, um, and I think South Face is positioned well to make a mark with those resources. I mean, there'll be a bunch of resources that go to consulting firms that will give us six, you know, feet thick worth of re reports and stuff like that. But y'all, I mean, y'all are rooted in community and in equity and in building science and being truthful, uh, authentic, you know, all those things. So groups like, and South Face is, is not the only group out there, um, but I think if, it seems like the resources, they're trying to get them down. But one of the big failures of the Obama administration was one, the money wasn't near as, as enough to get the job done. But two, they got it out quickly and not always to the folks who are authentic, if I just use that word. Um, and I think this is, this is going to be different. Um, it, 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 it's going to be hard work. Um, but at the end of it, I think you're going to have, I think you'll be successful. I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. So other questions that someone might have? Mike? Uh, Dennis, I, I guess I would like to hear your perspective on what are, I don't know if I can use the word game changer, but what, what's kind of exciting to you on the horizon? Well, the first thing I'd do if I were asked that question um, to be on a panel, I would call some folks up in this room <laughs> and get your ideas. Because, uh, you, know, you know, I work for a foundation now. My job is to give away money. My, you know, I track things, but I don't do it near as, much, as well as when I was here. And, you know, I'm five years out of date. That said, I mean, if I use the Candida building as, as an example, a couple of things about the Candida building, I think, are uh, cutting edge now. And, and several of you mentioned it. Um, the embodied um, energy, by embodied carbon of, of buildings is important. It's important to remember that operational energy use is still the number one use of most buildings. That said, we can't ignore the embodied carbon of, of buildings. And so I think that's gonna be something that we will see a lot of focus on now. And I think the Georgia, Georgia Tech did, a, and the team over at the Candida Building at its time, I think they did the best job of documenting um, 
the technologies and estimating the potential impact with very crude tools. You know, we need better tools to do that. Um, you know, Pond City Market is going to be doing a, a mass timber building. Um, no. It's under construction now. And what they did, and, and, and this is somewhat of an outlier, but it's also, you know, it, it needs to be forecasting the future. I mean, they're using wood harvested in Georgia, milled, processed in uh, Alabama to build a, a building here in Atlanta. And so, so the embodied carbon of that building um, will be much less than, frankly, the embodied carbon of the Candida building for the, the mass um, timber framing because we brought wood from halfway around the world or from Europe to do that. So um, the other thing, uh, uh, well, I'm going to go, another question? Um, yes. Well, it's, it, it's to be a catalyst. Um, you're, you're not going to build, um, you know, a billion square feet of commercial space like the federal government's going to do or whatever, or, you know, or build upon city market or whatever, but you can certainly be a catalyst in, in how things happen. And I would also say policy work. Um, John Sibley, this was another inflection point. John Sibley was the most respected environmental leader in the state of Georgia. He had retired as, as head of the Georgia Conservancy and done some other things. He came to me and he said, I, I want to come to work at South Face. I mean, John was, you know, in the, the um, golden years of his career. And it's like, John, why do you want to work at South Face? He says, I want to do policy work uh, and I need a platform to do it. And we had been doing policy work, but it was not a priority, to be honest. Not the priority it should have been. We said it was, but it wasn't. And so he helped us build a policy practice. And John said it eloquently. He said, policy is all about changing the rules of the game. You're never going to win the game if the rules are stacked against you. And so policy is how you change the rules of the game so that it's fair. And so that's why I think nonprofits are going to be critical to change policy. And I would argue that our policy work was very impactful because of, and many of you have heard me say this, and I love the term, and I stole it from someone else. I don't know who I stole it from. South Face has mud on its boots. We didn't just read a book and are telling you, here's what you ought to do. I mean, we have collective wisdom from 40 years of people like you working in various fields, in the institutional knowledge, the connections, the, you know, all that is just critical to make the policy work um, impactful, so. I am a proud South Face member. And so I love being a South Face member um, because of the work that y'all do. And I hope to see you at the summer solstice and learn more about each of you individually. Um, and so, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to get negative, but, you know, the other inflection point that y'all deserve credit for is, you know, there are so many nonprofits that did not come through the pandemic. Um, and everyone, every one of my grantees was scarred by the pandemic. And groups like South Face were scarred the most because you work with people. <laughs> you know, you were out there. Um, and so, you know, and you, and, and you adapted well. Um, I mean, you're stronger in some areas now than you were before the pandemic, but I know that there are got to be stress points because of the pandemic still. Um, financial stress points, programmatic stress points, and all. And so I am so proud that 
what y'all y'all accomplished, and you, I don't think we give credit to the nonprofits out there enough who really um, weathered an amazing set of challenges. Um, so, so thank you for doing that. Thanks for listening. You know, Dennis handed me my first LED light bulb. He said, James, this is a free light bulb. It costs $90. And I said, well, Dennis, what are we going to do with that? <laughs> well, Dennis, we want to thank you for all that you not only have done, but are doing. Dennis is a member. Dennis is a financial supporter. Dennis has supported us at Candida. Um, he's always available to us. He shows up. He's present. He shares. He gives. He does all the things that I think a great mentor would do a great leader would do, and I have a small token of appreciation today. So when you're at Edisto and you want to read something really serious, the, the Ministry for the Future, it's on my reading list for you. But Good you, summer reading, but James. You may, want, you may want to do just a, a quick little podcast. But it's no, really, actually. Once again, thinking about the future. You know, what, what are the possible futures? And then how do we be the catalyst that Dennis is mentioning? And how do we be, how do we be bold? How do we create more inflection points? And then, you know, how do we, we be willing to fail? Sometimes, you know, as an innovator and, a, and an entrepreneur, and to me, I'll define entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is not a person who starts a business uh, exclusively. Uh, there are a lot of, um, you know, Simon Sinek says an entrepreneur is a creative problem solver. And they can work in a very big company, they can work for the federal government or a large university, mm -hmm. but being a creative problem solver and willing to try and say, well, what if we did this? And in doing that, you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to learn and iterate. And the great geniuses of the software world that I grew up in, they have, you know, like Edison, all those failures, but, you know, they keep improving. They have a 1.0 product that becomes a 2.0 product that becomes a 3.0 product. And sometimes they fail altogether and they have to go start a new company, a new initiative, a new product. Uh, in my office, there's a Newton. And I don't know if you know what a Newton is, but Apple created a product called the Newton. And the Newton was like the Edsel at Ford. It is like the PC Junior at IBM. It is one of those things that is a commercial failure, but without Newton, we don't have iPhone. And so, you know, they didn't have enough memory. They didn't have enough uh, power in the processor, but they tried it anyway, and they attacked um, handwriting recognition, which is one of the harder apps to do. I mean, still not even done very well. But they then went to iPod, which was actually an MP3 player and was a really simple application. So without Newton, we don't get iPod. Without iPod, we don't get iPhone. And that's how innovation really works. But I want to thank Dennis for being here. Thanks for all that he does. And I hope you all have a few minutes to share with us. Yeah, you. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.